that, I would like to introduce Siobhan Pierce. She is uh, the Chief People Officer at Home Instead, which is an uh, independently owned franchise, and she is listed out of Long Beach, or she is housed out of Long Beach. Um, with that, I welcome you, Siobhan. Thank you. All right, well, let me get started with the presentation. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. The screen share isn't coming up. Hit screen share. There you go. Is it working? No, hold on. Hit screen share. Sorry. That's all right. You're, it's on, but we're going to just have to start it from the beginning. Okay. So the bottom, you see where it says screen share? Click on there that and go. then click on the, yeah, let me, all right, there you go. Sorry. That's all right. We'll want to make sure. Nope, it's still not. There we there go. go. So put it into your presentation mode. Sorry, everybody. And we have to make sure that you're getting the computer, uh, big more the computer. So, okay, we're good. I will be quite. My name is Siobhan Pierce, and I will be your presenter today. Please note that this webinar is pre recorded, but I will be available for live QA at the end of the presentation. And so I'd like to jump right in. As our population of aging adults continues to rise, the issue of aging in place safety has become a hot topic of conversation, and not just in the healthcare industry. People from all around the globe are impacted by this topic in some way. It seems that nearly every day I come in contact with someone who is, for the first time, facing a change or challenge with a family member, and they just need a little bit of information. My goal today is to help you prepare for or better understand how someone can be in place safely. I have set a few objectives for this webinar. By the end of this webinar, my goal is that you will have learned about the continuum of care available to you or your loved one throughout the aging process, We'll understand what safety hazards can exist in the home and how to remove or reduce those hazards. Raise your awareness of tools and resources to support your Hey, Siobhan. Siobhan. Yes. So, do you have something going on in the background? Uh, I do not. Hmm. Oh, Marilyn was on. That's why. Okay. We're good to go. My apologies for interrupting. We just had some No problem. Time. All right. You can continue. So, what you or your loved ones there. desire to be in place. And finally, have a clear picture of what today's costs of care are and options for how to pay for that care. But before we dive into these key points, I want to share some data with you and reassure you that if you're new to this topic, you're not alone. Home Instead Senior Care recently conducted research of North American homeowners between the ages of 55 and 75. This research sought to better understand how older adults are making plans And decisions about their forever homes and where there may be gaps in planning. Research found that 68% of seniors wish to live in their current home as they age while also remaining independent. 78% of those surveyed said they wish to remain at home because they're happy and comfortable. A third of survey respondents said that they want to live in a single family home but wish to relocate to a smaller or lower maintenance home as they age. What this tells us is people want to age in place. We know that home is tied to a sense of identity, is a place full of memories, is familiar, and feels safe. Many people are connected to their neighbors or have a faith-based community that they're close to. All these things factor into the appeal of staying in the home. Many times, however, homes are not designed with aging in mind. For example, the home I grew up in was built in the early 60s. And while it's a single story, there are stairs at every exterior entrance or exit, and the home also has narrow hallways and doorways. 
my mom, who's 91 now, has to navigate those stairs every day. And if she were to need to use a wheelchair, she could not easily get through the hallway or doorways. And she wants to remain in her home and continue to safely age in place. Before we talk about putting a plan together, let me share some additional research with you. Nearly 20 million people aged 65 or older visit an emergency room each year. Almost one third of those visits are related to injuries, many of which are sustained in the home. Our research found that well over one quarter of the visits to the ER were caused by falls or other household accidents. And interestingly enough, 65% of US adult children surveyed could identify at least one potential safety issue in their aging loved one's home. We also surveyed ER doctors who estimated that nearly 50% of all home accidents experienced by seniors can be prevented. ER docs reported that when talking with families about these accidents, the most common response was, we were afraid that something like this would happen. The majority of ER docs also indicated that having support or assistance within the home is beneficial for seniors and can help reduce the risk of accidents. With all that in mind, you can see that having a plan for safely aging in place is important. And in an ideal world, everyone would have a plan for how they want to age in place. But the reality is only one third of those wishing to stay in their current home have thought about making modifications to their home to allow them to safely age in place. And while 79% of older adults have given some thought to the idea of safely aging in place, nearly half of those people do not have or have not taken any action to put a plan together. Even more concerning is that only 37% have definite plans for safely aging in place. Of course, we know not everyone is a planner. And many aging adults do not talk with their families about this issue. In fact, about 73% of adult children have not planned for or thought about the care for their aging loved one or how to help that person stay in place safely while they age. So how do you put a plan together? It typically starts with a conversation. Here are some things to consider. Putting a plan together may include talking about home modifications or alternatives to staying in the person's current home. We know, however, that some families find their aging loved one is resistant to any type of change. Understanding and addressing those reasons help move the conversation along. From my own experience, there are several reasons for resistance. Older adults can be fiercely independent. They may not want to admit or accept that they need assistance. One solution to this is to explain the reasons for offering help and approach it in a positive way. Restating to your loved one that the goal of the assistance is to help them maintain their independence and safely age in place where they're comfortable and in familiar surroundings. Discussing all their alternatives such as assisted living or a nursing home may help extend the conversation and provide insight to their concerns. Older adults may not want modifications as they believe it will impact the look and aesthetics of their current home. Sometimes it's a compromise. With my mom, we agreed that two of the four exterior staircases could have a railing put on as she didn't want to detract from the look of the house by having rails put in for the front door staircase. If you're at an impasse in the conversation, sometimes a physician or trusted family friend who has had a positive experience with modifications to a home might be an additional voice of reason. The older adult may fear that asking for help will be a sign that they can't handle living on their own. They may think talking about needing assistance will lead to an expedited nursing home or assisted living placement. Having the conversation about the changes and how you want to do the opposite of move them can really smooth the way for an extended conversation. Explaining the goal is to adapt the environment to help them age in place safely will also help them stay there longer. I always recommend that people be thoughtful in their comments and be careful about making promises they may not be able to keep. Older adults may have an emotional connection to a hazardous item. You may be asking yourself, what type of item would that be? Honestly, it could be something as simple as a throw rug or a table with sharp edges. Either one can be in a place that is hazardous and could lead to someone tripping or falling or bumping into and getting a big cut. You can try to find other uses for these items like hanging a rug on a wall, moving the table to a spot where it's out of the way but can still be enjoyed. 
So really the important thing here is to encourage your loved one to help find a place to put these items and let them continue to enjoy them without getting rid of them. Cognitive impairment or forgetfulness can also be a barrier to home safety. Forgetting to turn off the stove, not understanding the sound coming from a smoke alarm, slipping in the shower because the person doesn't use the shower chair that was just purchased last week. These are all things that contribute to, again, that safely aging in place. And finally, inaccessibility to getting in or out of the house or up and down the stairs safely can lead to challenging safety issues when someone is choosing to age in place. Many families have zero plans in place for ensuring safety and providing care at home to an aging loved one. Typically, most people end up making decisions during a crisis or an emotionally charged situation. But talking about things in advance can pave the way to a smoother transition as a loved one ages and their needs and abilities change. Communication is the key and when it comes to aging in place safely, the conversation typically never happens too soon. These are good things to keep in mind when talking with your loved one about aging in place safely. I know both personally and professionally that being a family caregiver can feel like you're in a role reversal. As the caregiver, you assume the role of protector, ensuring the safety of your loved one. It's important for everyone's sanity and well-being to remain helpful and positive. Arguing really does not help, but having a calm demeanor and listening to your loved one will help the conversation continue. The whole idea of aging in place can be a sensitive topic and really can trigger an emotional response. It's why we want to make sure that conversations are centered around maintaining the senior's dignity and respect and convey that this is an opportunity to work together towards a common goal of safely aging in place. One thing many people forget to ask is if the senior actually feels safe in their home. Really listening to what they're saying as well as watching for body language that conflicts with what you're hearing will help you work towards some form of resolution. And of course, starting the conversation before you need to make a change really eases the pressure and gives your aging loved one a chance to be a part of the planning. Putting a plan together may include Communication is the key, and when it comes to aging in place safely, the conversation typically never happens too soon. These are good things to keep in mind when talking with your loved one about aging in place safely. I know both personally and professionally that being a family caregiver can feel like you're in a role reversal. As the caregiver, you assume the role of protector, ensuring the safety of your loved one. It's important for everyone's sanity and well-being to remain helpful and positive. Arguing really does not help, but having a calm demeanor and listening to your loved one will help the conversation continue. The whole idea of aging in place can be a sensitive topic and really can trigger an emotional response. It's why we want to make sure that conversations are centered around maintaining the senior's dignity and respect and convey that this is an opportunity to work together towards a common goal of safely aging in place. One thing many people forget to ask is if the senior actually feels safe in their home. Really listening to what they're saying as well as watching for body language that conflicts with what you're hearing will help you work towards some form of resolution. And of course, starting the conversation before you need to make a change really eases the pressure and gives your aging loved one a chance to be a part of the planning and solution. The next two slides will provide some examples of ways to start the conversation. I'll give you a minute or two to read through the samples and when talking with your loved one about a sensitive topic, know that I recommend a few things. Remove distractions. Turn down the TV or radio. Find a quiet corner of the room to sit and talk. Make sure your loved one is comfortable. Is the room too hot, too cold? Are they sitting in their favorite chair? Is there enough light in the room? Think before you speak and always do more listening than talking. And most importantly, be sincere with your intentions. The next slide gives some examples of what your loved one might say to you in response to your comments during the conversation. As you read through these responses, think about what you might say to keep the conversation going.
As we age, we will all encounter some physical changes that are part of the natural aging process. Everyone ages differently, but let me share some common effects of aging with you. Understanding these changes may help as you talk with your loved one about aging in place safely. Eyesight. By the time someone is 60, pupils decrease to about one third the size they were at age 20. Add to that age-related eye conditions such as cataracts or macular degeneration and their world can look blurry. Consider what might happen in a room with poor lighting, throw rugs and electrical cords crossing pathways and you have a good idea of what might cause a fall. Smell. Sense of smell can diminish, especially after age 70 because the loss of nerve endings and less mucus in the nose. The concern here is if your loved one would be able to smell gas, smoke, or burning food. Another aspect of smell is that it greatly affects our sense of taste. With taste, we start out with more than 10,000 taste buds and they decrease in number and mass with aging. A loss of taste may be harmful if the person cannot taste spoiled food, placing them at risk for food poisoning. But loss of taste also has an impact on a person's overall nutrition at times. When someone can no longer taste something, they may overseason it. This can be especially risky for people on low sodium diets, for example. Or maybe a person may lose the desire to eat because nothing tastes good, and that creates an opportunity for malnutrition, which could lead to weakness or an increased risk of falls. Touch. Decreased blood flow to nerve endings as we age can reduce a person's sensitivity to pain and temperature. Also losing feeling in the feet or toes could result in an unsteady balance and loss of feeling in the fingers or hands can result in the inability to grip properly. With hearing, our ears control the hearing and our sense of balance, both of which can be compromised as we age. Hearing loss can impact safety and interfere with a person's ability to socialize. With a few of the senses, you can easily draw a connection between diminished sense and increased opportunity for compromised safety, especially as an increase for fall risk. So here's what I can tell you about falls. They are common. One in four older adults fall each year. They can be fatal. Shockingly, every 19 minutes, an older adult dies from a fall. And they can be costly. Hospital costs for a fall average about $30,000. And after a fall, many older adults develop a fear of falling and as a result may reduce or limit their activities and social engagements. Fear of falling can result in physical decline, depression, social isolation, and feelings of helplessness. I wanna drill down on this subject a little bit further. There are three factors we consider when thinking about fall risk. Physical risk factors are changes in your body that increase your risk for a fall. We talked about the five senses, but natural aging affects all the systems of the body as well, and physical changes can re result and contribute to the risk of falling. Behavioral risk factors are things that we do or don't do that increase the risk of falling. For example, exercising and working on strength and balance may help reduce the risk of falling. Environmental risk factors are hazards in our home or community, things like rugs, cords lying on the floor, even cracked sidewalks. So really, prevention is the key when it comes to falls. With physical activity, even small amounts on a regular basis can contribute to someone's flexibility, balance, and stamina, and really go a long way towards fall prevention. With the doctor's approval, families should encourage their aging loved one to be more active. Activities such as walking, water aerobics, or Tai Chi are a gentle form of exercise. Even simple chair exercises can have benefits. It's also important to be mindful of medications that someone takes. Some medicines have side effects such as drowsiness or dizziness, and those make falls more likely. Having a pharmacist or doctor review all the medications a person takes can help reduce the chance of risky side effects and drug interactions. Addressing safety issues, whether it's ensuring a safe environment or encouraging your loved one to use the walker or cane that was recommended will also help fall prevention. And as I mentioned earlier, cognitive decline may also contribute to safety issues for an aging loved one. The home can be a dangerous place for someone who is experiencing cognitive decline or forgetfulness. The overall goal is to create an environment where the individual can successfully continue 
to safely age in place. Safeguarding the home is one important preparedness step that family caregivers should take. Some things to consider when evaluating for safety include cleaning products, chemicals, and even tools that could potentially pose a danger to an older adult, particularly some with a Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia. Consider storing these types of items in a locked cabinet or somewhere out of reach. Appliances may also pose a potential safety hazard. Sometimes simply unplugging the item is an easy first step. When preparing meals or heating water for a shower, be aware of temperature and understand your loved one's preferences and tolerance level for temperature. Protecting your aged loved one may also mean you need to consider attaching alarms to doors or windows or adding a doorknob cover to the inside of the doors that lead outside. This is especially important if your loved one has the tendency to wander. One family caregiver named Arlene was able to make a modification to her home because of her husband's wandering. He often woke at night not knowing where he was or thinking it was time to get up. She put a motion detector in the bedroom. That way if he got up, an alarm would sound. And that really helped Arlene to keep her husband safe. Lastly, don't overlook creating plans in case of emergency. There are lots of questions to ask when putting an emergency plan together. How will your loved ones safely exit their home if there's a fire in the home or an earthquake? What if your loved one is alone and they fall? How will they reach the phone in case of an emergency? Do you have a list of all medications your aging loved one takes? How about a list of allergies? Where do you keep spare batteries for hearing aids or an electric wheelchair? There are several general home safety concerns to also consider. Checking home lighting at different times throughout the day and at various times throughout the year, there are points in time where it is brighter or darker at certain times of day. Having a timer set to turn lights on or off is an easy solution to ensure rooms are lit properly and consistently as needed. Other considerations might be a nightlight or remote switch controls. Sometimes even rearranging furniture can be helpful in providing easier controlled access to switches. Clutter is a concern for many family caregivers I've talked with over the years. Working with your loved one to limit the amount of clutter buildup will help reduce the opportunity for fall risks in the home. Encourage your aging loved one to wear comfortable shoes, fitted slippers, or non-skid socks in the home, especially if the phone home has slippery flooring. This is always a good option to contribute to helping prevent falls. If the home has stairs, we encourage people to make sure there is a sturdy handrail at the proper height that the stairs are well lit and of course free from clutter and if necessary consider a chairlift. Other precautions to consider are having some obvious sign or marking to make the person aware of a step down or a change in floor height. Accessibility is an important consideration as well when thinking about safety in the home. Something as simple, simple as reorganizing the refrigerator and putting heavier items on lower shelves or moving frequently used pots and pans to a different cabinet that has easier access is a good place to start. Finally, don't forget about the bathroom. Tubs and showers are full of potential for a fall. Placing non-skid stickers on the bottom of the tub, installing grab bars and a removable shower head, plus having a shower chair or bench available, all make for a much safer environment. Toilets may not seem like a big safety concern, but many toilet seats are low or the toilets are in place where the person sitting needs to grab onto something when getting up. Frequently, I hear from a family caregiver that their mom or dad uses the towel rack to steady themselves before sitting down on the toilet or getting into the shower. Sturdy, professionally installed grab bars are the safest bet in this situation. Other considerations may include getting something like a raised toilet seat. In today's age, no discussion would be complete without talking about how technology plays a role in safety as well. With the rise of gadgets available in the market today, there is an endless supply of technology-based items to help make a senior's life easier. I'm going to cover a few of the multitude of options available. Medication management is the first one. There are a variety of pill dispensers on the market that can help take the confusion out of managing medications daily, including one that comes with a beeping reminder and flashing lights. Another option is to have an alert set up on your loved one's smartphone. There are also companies that will prepackage med medications for each dosing time. 
for one solution, you can go to www.simplemeds.com. The latest smart technology options include video doorbells and voice or remote controlled thermostats. You may also consider a virtual assistance such as Amazon's Echo or Google Home, which helps homeowners control things in the home with a simple voice command. Another safety innovation available today is a stove fire prevention device. These devices automatically shut off a stove if it's left unattended for a specific amount of time. It's a great feature for someone who is experiencing dementia-like symptoms. Making things safer at home means using all the resources available to widen your selection of options. Let me share a few more ideas that have also come out of the technology sector. There are adaptive tools for both inside and outside the home, whether it's using a handheld magnifier for helping with vision deficiencies, labeling things in the home so a person can remember how to use something or just remember what that thing is, having a medication management system with an audible reminder, or having gardening tools made for accommodating balance issues. There are affordable home monitoring systems now available that can help family caregivers keep tabs on the health and safety of their aging loved one. Some systems can even monitor body temperature and sleep, while others provide fall detection and emergency response options. For people with hearing loss, amplified phones, which feature an extra loud ringer and voice volume can really make a difference. My mom has hearing aids and they're connected via Bluetooth technology to her iPhone. So she's able to control the volume and talk with people with the communication going directly through her hearing aid. There are many fun items on the market as well as the including adaptive card holders, large print cards, which can provide a way for someone with vision loss and dexterity challenges to participate in games. Devices like the GrandPad, which you see in the picture on the slide now, help connect seniors with their loved ones remotely using virtual connections to communicate, share photos, and memories. Some people are taking advantage of GPS tracking systems to help ensure the safety of their loved ones who may wander. There are many safety benefits from new and emerging technology that is available to consumers today. And while technology is great, I firmly believe you cannot replace the human touch. Using technology in conjunction with other resources can help keep your loved ones safe and able to age in place. One final consideration when thinking about safety at home is what to do if your loved one has a pet at home with them. While our furry friends can make great companions, they can also be a safety concern. More than 21,000 older adults are treated in emergency rooms each year due to falls associated with their pet dogs and cats, says a report from the CDC. While that may not seem like a huge number, the scary part is that the highest rate of injuries from all pet-related falls occurs in people older than age 75. And the most common diagnosis is a potentially life-altering one older people really want to avoid, a fracture. Those darling furry friends, in fact, are a tripping hazard and not just the small dogs. My dog likes to sleep on the floor right beside where my mom sleeps when she comes to visit. He's a big black Labrador, so when it's dark, he blends right in. Sometimes he's almost invisible, especially for someone that has reduced vision. If my mom doesn't remember to check the floor before putting her foot down or the dog is not right next to the bed, she could trip over him and down she would go. Other dogs may leave toys around the house or may create a fall risk because they're big, they jump up on someone and that person loses their balance. Another fall risk occurs when taking multiple dogs out on leashes and those leashes become tangled. The most important thing is really to talk with your loved one about the potential risks with their pet. When you're with them, watch the interaction with the pet and consider a pet helper if you feel there is any risk associated with caring for the pet. Sometimes we find that even though the senior realizes there are risks associated with keeping a pet, they don't wanna part with their beloved companion. So you have to consider some additional options. When it's no longer safe for the pet to remain in the home with your aging loved one, or your loved one is no longer capable of caring for their pet, here are some options to consider. One is adoption, either by a friend or a relative or even a local pet shelter. Find ways to keep your loved one engaged with animals through either pet therapy programs or volunteering time at a local shelter. Some people have even gone as far to as to purchase a robotic companion that looks like a dog 
um, as an alternative to having a live pet. But most importantly, remember that helping your loved one to continue to age in place safely is the goal. It's always sad when a pet and owner must part ways, so try to reduce your own feelings of guilt by searching for the positive. Look at pictures of the pet with your loved one. Talk about the pet. Reminisce about the pet and fun times that you've had with that pet. Those are all ways that can helpfully ease some of that sadness. I've talked a lot about different safety concerns and shared some ideas on how to address those concerns and help your loved one age in place safely. Aging safely at home doesn't need to be complicated. The experts tell us it's a combination of design sense and common sense. Focusing your efforts on those two goals could help ensure independence for your loved one. For more free resources, visit homeyourownway.com. Let's talk about some other options for you to consider. In conjunction with the University of Buffalo, Home and Still built a safety checklist. This is available for downloading by going to the website listed on your screen, www.makinghomesaferforseniors.com. The checklist reviews safety consideration for all the common rooms in a home. Senior home safety experts recommend that adult children of seniors take at least one day each year to perform a thorough safety check of their parents' home. We encourage families to make this near a holiday, like New Year's Day, or make it part of a spring cleaning event. No matter when you choose to go through the checklist, always be sure to involve the seniors who live in the home when feasible. As a starting point, here are five easy fixes that you can do for under $500. Purchase and install handheld shower heads. Install grab bars on walls near the shower, the tub, or even the toilet. Convert to lever handle faucets. Add lighting to closets and pantries. Add swing clear hinges. The next slide is a list of some additional resources for you. I'll give you a moment to review those and write them down. Now I'd like to move on and talk about the continuum of care. There are many categories within the continuum of care. This is another way of describing the different living and care options for someone who is aging and needing assistance. The first five take place in the home setting. They are aging in place, family care, senior centers and adult care centers, home health care and home care. The next part of the continuum of care generally requires a move from the home in most instances. These additional options include retirement and independent living, assisted living facilities, skilled nursing facilities, and hospice care. It can be helpful to view these options on a spectrum. As you can see, the levels of care are laid out on a graph. The graph shows the relationship between the level of care and the cost. The bottom axis showing the level of care and supervision from independence to highly skilled care. The cost is shown on the left axis. Some types of care range in price. Let's talk a little bit more about this care continuum in detail, starting with aging in place. 90% of Americans over age 65 want to stay at home, and 80% think home is where they will always live. If you think about it, home for many is where they have years of memories, where they've raised their children, where they've known their neighbors and the local area. They likely have a favorite grocery store, pharmacy, faith community, dry cleaner, and probably a favorite restaurant or park. While aging in place is a goal for many people, there are things to consider when making it a reality. The key to aging in place is making the home safe and comfortable. Earlier in my presentation, I covered many things that should be considered in order to help a loved one age in place safely and successfully, including making modifications to the home to ensure safety and minimize risks. 
I listed several things on the continuum of care that may be considered when choosing to age in place. Please keep in mind that while I will talk about each of these options independently, sometimes aging in place includes bringing in outside help, which could be family care, home care, or home health, or reaching outside the home for assistance through a community or adult daycare program. When an older adult needs assistance, family members are typically the first to step in and help. In general, there are fewer family caregivers available to help these days. And there is also a growing distance between family members with one or more adult child living on average more than 280 miles from their aging parent. Some families move into se seniors home and sometimes the senior will move into the home with their family. I also know of several people who've added a separate building on their property where their aging loved one actually lives. This can provide a safe level of independence while the family is nearby and able to assist at a moment's notice. Here are some important things to consider. Who's available to care? Family members can each contribute to their loved one's care in different ways that do not require hands-on support. For example, one person may be in charge of ordering supplies online while another actually provides the day-to-day -day caring. How much time does one family member have to provide hands-on care? It's important to understand any time constraints that may impact being able to provide care. Does the family member live close enough to provide consistent care? Does the family member have the financial resources to be the primary caregiver? And finally, will the family member feel comfortable providing all types of care? For example, hands-on bathing assistance may not be something a family member is comfortable with. Next, let's talk about senior and adult daycare centers. Senior centers are a great option and are available in cities throughout the U.S. Today, almost 10,000 senior centers serve more than 1 million older adults every day. Senior centers provide primarily social and recreational programs and services, and most include meals and wellness programs. To participate, the person must be in generally good mental and physical health and must be able to transport themselves to the center unless the center has transportation services. Adult care centers, also known as adult daycare, are another type of support service in the community. There are about 4,600 of those type centers in the United States. These centers typically have supervised social and recreational services and are generally geared towards seniors with age-associated disabilities, most commonly Alzheimer's or other types of dementia. And the center typically will also serve meals and have activities for participants. In both of these types of programs, it's typically something that happens during the daytime, Monday through Friday. There are some weekend programs, but this type of solution is usually offered or used in addition to home care needs that may exist outside of normal day, Monday through Friday hours. Home care is also called non-medical in-home care, and it's typically confused with home health care. In-home care is designed to help the person who chooses to age in place live independently for a longer period of time. Caregivers come to the home to assist the person who, although able to live independently, wants or needs assistance with activities of daily living, things such as bathing, grooming, incontinence care, medication reminders, meal preparation, light housekeeping, and assistance with getting to errands or appointments. Caregivers also provide care to aging adults with Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia who are more comfortable remaining in their own home. Home health is a skilled level of care in the home at the direction of a doctor, usually occurring after a debilitating event such as a stroke or heart attack or a broken hip. Home health is strictly medical care and is usually offered for a short period of time. When my father was discharged from the hospital after surgery, for example, his doctor wrote orders for home health visits. It included weekly visits from nurses who checked his vitals and wound healing and physical therapy visits. Sometimes upon discharge from the hospital, the person returning home needs more than home help than just home health. Non-medical in-home care is frequently used in conjunction with home health care services. Next on the continuum are retirement and independent living communities. 
This is a broad category because retirement and independent living communities can range from luxurious to basic. Some are simply apartments for those who are 55 plus, while others include meals, housekeeping, transportation, and activities. Most communities, however, do offer social activities. Important questions to ask when considering this type of living environment are, what is and is not included in the monthly rate? Can help be brought in if it's needed? And when would a move from that community be required? Assisted living facilities offer apartment style living with increased amounts of support and assistance. Typically, they offer a meal plan with a community dining room and many have transportation services for the residents. They can be an ideal solution for those who want the convenience of a home, need a selection of support services, and are desirous of an active social life. When considering this option, there are some important questions to ask. What is included in the monthly fee? Are there services that come at an extra cost? Note that oftentimes these additional services are provided a la carte. What if more care is needed? Is there a limit to the care provided? It is important to understand at what point a move or relocation might have to occur. Understand what the staff ratios are and if using memory care services, is there a staff member or members trained specifically on dementia care? Skilled Nursing is a healthcare institution that has at least one full-time RN as well as a doctor and provides nursing care 24 hours a day. Typically, people who have complex medical needs will consider living in this environment. Many times, this is a transitional living choice after someone has been hospitalized but is not quite ready to return home. It's important to exercise great care in choosing a facility. Certainly, after the fallout we've seen from the pandemic, many families are reconsidering whether this is a reasonable option. Nevertheless, it's still good to have information on all your options. If you're considering using the services of a skilled nursing facility, you can go to the website listed on the screen, www.medicare.gov forward slash N-H-C-O-M-P-A-R-E to look at the ratings nursing homes have received. When considering your options, think about the following. Understand the ratio of staff to residents. Get information about physician availability. Understand costs, financing, how many days of coverage are provided under Medicare, um, and if they accept Medicaid. Inquire about therapy options. Learn about staff training, including universal safety precautions, COVID-19 monitoring, and compliance. Look at activities offered. What is the proximity to the family members that are going to visit? And the number one bullet point on there that you see is visit, observe, ask, and try. Right now, that may be a challenge during uh, the pandemic, but where you can, maybe there's a virtual tour that you can take, get as much information up front as possible. Hospice care is another level of care, but most important is hospice is not a place, but a service. There are often misconceptions among families and older adults about hospice. The service exists to help support those who are at the end of their lives with the goal of providing care that includes comfort and pain relief. As with all other options we've discussed in the continuum, hospice is a choice. I frequently hear from families that they wish they could have started hospice sooner. In almost all cases, a person on hospice is no longer receiving curative treatment. Frequently, the person receiving care under hospice is living in their own home. Now that we've covered the types of care in the continuum, let's talk about when a change in care may be needed. I'm often asked when is the right time to step in and provide assistance to an aging loved one. Timing is really different for each person and there are many factors to consider. Let's look at three leading indicators of change in a person's abilities and we'll talk about when to get involved. If you're observing changes that include forgetfulness, which impacts daily life, this may be a sign that there is a change in mental or cognitive skills. Signs might include seeing scorched pots and pans, pill boxes that still have pills in them when they should have been taken. 
missing appointments, spoiled food in the pantry or refrigerator, or bills piling up. Emotional or social changes might include your loved one saying they are no longer interested in socializing with friends or family. They may show signs of depression, be reluctant to leave their home, even for a short walk or a trip to the market. Of course, with the pandemic, there are many folks who are choosing not to leave their home for any reason in the interest of their own health and well-being. It's important not to mistake caution for withdrawal. Physical and medical changes might be indicated when your loved one shows a loss of interest in maintaining personal hygiene standards or loses interest in eating or drinking. Other signs may be that they are no longer keeping the house clean. Another indicator of loss of physical ability might be observed when a person's driving ability or skill starts to decline. If an older adult is experiencing any of these types of changes, family members will likely step in to help. Families may also consider services in the home to help support their aging loved one. I often hear from family members that are trying to fit in visits to their parents' home to help address safety issues or to assist with the health and well-being of their loved one. The number one question I hear is what should they do and when is it time to make a change? As I shared previously, there are many different care options available for helping someone remain at their home. I'm also asked when is it the right time to move from a home to a care facility? This can be a really tough decision to make. There are some general indicators that can help families determine if it's time to move from home to a facility. Here are a few scenarios to consider. If you've tried to bring in a caregiver or other professional to assist your loved one, but they refuse to accept the help. If your loved one care needs are beyond the level of care available to them in a home setting. This could be due to a medical condition or because the home is just no longer safe or suitable for independent living. For those with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia, if behavioral symptoms are just too much to manage at home, this might include combativeness that puts you or a caregiver in danger. Sometimes it's because the cost for 24 hour or around the clock care is just outside the financial resources available to your loved one or the family. Sometimes the cost of a care facility can be more economical. As I said, each situation is different and not everyone's situation can be compared to a checklist when making this type of decision. I hope at least these guidelines are helpful and are starting point for making this type of decision. So now let's talk about who pays for the care. Many people I talk to are unsure how care is, up, is paid for. Oftentimes people are under the impression that care will be paid either by Social Security or Medicare or even an existing retirement account. The reality is Social Security benefits typically are not high enough to allow for the cost of care in addition to helping pay for a person's basic living needs. Frequently, the true cost of care is unknown or underestimated. People are living longer, so personal savings are often inadequate and more often than not. Planning hasn't really happened, so the family is working on a solution when triggered by a crisis. So what is the cost of care? When you add up the total amount spent on long-term care in the U.S., it's estimated to be $450 billion per year and rising. The reality is that 70% of Americans who reach age 65 will be unable to care for themselves without assistance at some point. And with the growing aging population, that 450 billion is naturally going to increase. So let me share some national averages for the cost of various types of care with you. Genworth has a great resource that helps calculate the cost of care and provides local and national median cost figures. I will share their website with you on a resource slide near the end of the presentation. What you see here is that obviously we can't put a dollar amount on the cost of family care as those costs include not only the financial implications of family members providing the care, but also the emotional and physical costs, which are really hard to monetize. Please keep in mind the amount you see on this slide are from 2019. 
At that time, the average or median cost of home care in the LA area was about $28 per hour. In 2020, the median hourly rate is closer to $30 to $35 per hour. Adult daycare was about $76 per day in 2019, with assisted living costs running about $4,500 per month and skilled nursing costs close to $250 per day for a semi-private room, and a private room was closer to $300. Keep in mind that cost is going to vary based on market demand and also location. So how does a senior or their family pay for care? There are several different options to consider when determining how to pay for long-term care. The first is to self-insure, which is just another way of saying someone is paying out of pocket or paying privately. A good portion of care is paid privately. Some people use a long-term care insurance policy to pay for their care. In fact, about 8 million Americans are now covered by these types of policies. Plans are written a variety of ways and there is a wide range of coverage options. Many people I talk to have those policies but don't really understand the parameters or benefits of their policies or even how to activate them. Long-term care can be a costly option to consider if someone is over 65 and does not already have a plan in place. There's another option called a medically underwritten annuity. It's a newer product that insurance companies are now offering. As with any insurance product, you should really seek the input of an insurance or financial advisor before making any decisions on buying a policy or setting up an annuity. Medicare and Medicaid are programs that most people have heard of or have some familiarity with. Let me provide a little bit of information about these two programs and know that both are considered entitlement programs. Medicare is a health insurance plan for seniors available around age 65 and has a qualifier tied to Social Security contributions and was designed initially to cover acute care episodes. There are two parts of Medicare, Part A and Part B. Part A is considered hospital insurance and covers inpatient stays, skilled nursing care, and hospice care. Part B was designed as supplemental insurance and is voluntary. The program has a monthly premium and covers things like physician services, lab tests, durable medical equipment, and some therapeutic services. There are numerous standardized policies, so it's important to review the policy options. Another alternative for seniors is called the Medicare Advantage Plan. This is a private insurance alternative and comes with a monthly premium. Again, please be clear on options and any policy coverage limitations if you're considering this option. Medicaid is a means-tested welfare program designed to help the poor and disabled of all ages. For those over 65, it will help pay for nursing home costs once the person has exhausted all or most of their own means. Because of strict guidelines, it's important to understand coverage restrictions and limitations before using this resource. Another source of paying for long-term care is offered through the Veterans Administration. One in three seniors in the U.S. is either a veteran or a surviving spouse of a veteran. For qualified persons, there are a few different options, including the Aid and Attendance Program and the Homemaker Home Health Aid Program. To see if you or your loved one qualify, contact your local VA. For more information on care resources, cost of care, and funding sources, let me go to the next slide. I'll give you a minute to write down some of these options. I know I've provided a lot of information during this webinar. I would be happy to answer questions you may have. Please see that our email address is noted on the slide along with a few other websites that can offer more information or solutions for you to consider. I'll take questions now. Siobhan, you wanna come back on camera? There you go. I think I start video. May not have my camera on. Oh. Do you see? Let me see if I can get you to see if that helps. If not, we can just there you go. Hi. Oh, Hi everybody. You again. 
Thank that was you. awesome. That was very helpful. I know personally for me, um, so I have a situation that is, uh, it applies to you, but um, we had good attendance today. Um, we don't, I think you had such a thorough uh, presentation that I really don't see any questions. Um, okay. People can contact you. This is going to be videotaped so they can go back and look at the information. Um, do you have any closing remarks that you'd like to say? No, I just appreciate everybody's time and um, please reach out if there's any resources or questions you have. We're happy to be here and answer those for you. Wonderful. Thank you again and thank you all to all our attendees. You guys have a great day. Bye-bye now. Bye.